Steve Dale. The, the only person who has what I call the best way of introducing it's me or the dog more than anybody, any announcer that I've known. Um, welcome. Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad I'm speaking to you. Can you please tell everybody what I mean? Can you just show them, give them an example? Victoria Stilwell has been the host of It's Me or the Dog! Yes! I love it. You know, it makes me smile all the time when I hear you say that, Steve, because it's like the only person who can do that is you. And of course, because you've been a radio host for so many years, I'm not saying you're old, but you've been a radio host for so many years in Chicago and nationally. Um, and you're also going to be presenting at the Dog Behavior Conference about dogs and cats, how to be a diplomat. I think this is this is the first time we've had a speaker talk about that relationship between dogs and cats. So for all of you out there who haven't registered yet, the Dog Behavior Conference, April the 1st to the 3rd, be there or be square. It is virtual online. Doesn't matter where you are in the world. We are going to be live, but don't worry. You don't have to sit there for three days listening to us live. You can, as soon as you've registered and the presentations have gone out live, you'll get access to those presentations for 12 months. Um, Steve, I am so excited that you are going to be speaking about this really important subject. But can you, first of all, tell everybody a little bit about what you do? Sure. So I am a certified animal behavior consultant. I've been honored to contribute to a long list of veterinary textbooks, as well as books for pet parents. Uh, I host, as you mentioned, several different radio shows. I, I like you, am on television, uh, but I don't make the impression you do on television because you are Victoria Stillwell. You know, but in all seriousness, I, you know, you and I are friends. And I, I am so proud to be your friend, not only because of the kind of person I know you are, but also because you came along at just the right time to change what we thought of dog training on television. And I'm so grateful for that. We needed you. We still need you in America. We need you more than what we see in America, which is unfortunate because you're on in the UK all the time, I'm told that if you have a coffee maker, they can get you on the coffee maker in the UK. Uh, but here, not enough, uh, you know, yeah, which is unfortunate. Uh, you know, I was talking yesterday to Mikkel Becker, who I know you know. Yes. A dog, a dog trainer. Amazing. And we were talking about the, uh, the number of misconceptions that people still have uh, about dominance and all those sorts of things, you know. And, and you just said, all right, this is just not true and busted those myths. So thank you very much. I'm honored to be a participant. You and I have talked about doing this for a long time. Yes. Uh, because cats are important. I'm also on the board of directors of uh, what used to be called the Wind Feline Foundation, uh, rebranded called the Every Cat Health Foundation. So if you have a cat, everything pretty much over the past 52 years that we've learned about cats was once funded by this organization from vaccines they get to understanding diseases they get, understanding diseases we thought they get, to understanding cat behavior. In truth, don't take offense to this, but man's best friend, they're cats. There are more cats, at least in the US, than there are dogs. If you, if you, if you do the count, uh, there simply are. And what makes this talk uh, more, I think, uh, important than ever before are, are several factors that come together all at the same time. Uh, right, wrong, or otherwise, there are more divorces in America than ever before. So you have all of these families, these mixed families coming together. So this family had uh, two dogs and has two dogs, and this family has a cat, and now they're coming together. People are also getting married later than ever before in history. Oh, yes. Uh, and and yep. they're, they're, they don't have pets. They have fur babies, and they are very important appropriately, uh, particularly to millennials and those in the Gen X generation. So here's what happens. They're getting married, but they already have a family. 
with four legs and and they may have a cat or two cats or three cats and he may have two cats too and maybe a dog and now they've come together so it isn't just going into a home anymore if you're a professional dog trainer dog behavior consultant for example and dealing only with the dog issue if there's a cat in the home because as any trainer and I, i'm sure you can confirm this you're not only dealing with the dog who is wanting to eat up every other dog or pulling their person down the street on the leash or whatever the situation is that you're called in for, you're dealing with the entire family dynamic as well. And now that family dynamic may include a cat or two or three. Also, there are problems, behavior problems that relate to both dogs and cats. For example, you open the door just to go for a walk with the dog. But the cat wants to run outside the door. What do you do about that? Or you have a dog with an appetite for, how shall I say? You can see in the background, litter box. There it is. Right? Yep, there it is. Uh, we at the moment only have one dog, and uh, that dog is not interested. But what if the dog was interested in what comes out the other end of the cat? As um, many dogs are. Indeed. Indeed. Yes. And there are lots of reasons why that's not a good thing for the dog or the cat, because cats can be very offended by those big, smelly, slobbery things we call dogs investigating their toilet. That's 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 an affront. They, they want to get a personal attorney to deal with this. Issue. <laughs> or what sometimes they do is just say, forget about it. I'm not using that litter box. And if you have a cat that's not using the litter box, then you have a cat that may be relinquished. Uh, because that is, in fact, the number one reason why cats are given up. So we cannot, I don't believe anymore, um, have tunnel vision and, uh, for professionals and for pet parents. Same answer, really. It's not just about the dog. It's, it's about the entire family. And that family now, statistically, often includes at least one cat. Yeah. And, you know, uh, in your title, you put that people are actually better at reading canine behavior than they are feline behavior yeah and yeah. and i definitely you know i mean i remember i'm a dog behavior consultant and so i go into homes and i'm like oh the cat's there and i had to very quickly learn wait a second when i go into these homes i might have to be dealing with both species exactly right and you know um what television has taught us not you thank goodness but there are consultants that come in deal with the dog issue and it may relate directly with the cat and the cat is under the sofa i mean underneath or maybe on top of the cat tree and that person says well pull the cat out i need to see that behavior <laughs> i know you're shaking your head but we we so that's the number one no-no. We don't need to do that. We don't need to replicate the behavior. If we try to do that with dogs, the good news is dogs tend to be somewhat forgiving and they go on with their lives, et cetera, et cetera. That cat, you, by doing this, you can absolutely uh, change the way in which that cat temporarily or permanently interacts with family as well. I mean, that cat is just going to give the middle digit to everyone involved, perhaps, because, you know, the other thing is, uh, yes, cat psyche is so different than dog psyche. So dogs are predators. Cats are predator and prey, ethologically. Now, I say that and it's not quite really true because dogs have been domesticated for so long that, as you know, in third world countries, dogs don't go out generally. There are exceptions. They don't go out generally with other dogs in packs. Again, there are exceptions. And they don't hunt generally. Oh, well, they do. What they do is they hunt pizza yes. thrown in the garbage can at yeah. the back of the restaurant. They, they hunt at the garbage dump at the end, edge of the city. Mm. But that's not really hunting. But they're not having to take down an animal most no. of the time. And, and most of the time, they would have no clue as to how to do that. Cats, that is still in them. But what's also still in cats is the fact that they are predator and prey. So 
I don't believe the cats get up in the morning actually thinking who, who, who is going to eat me. But that's ingrained in who they are. So it is so important for cats to feel safe. And you can argue that's true for all of us, and it's true for dogs too. But it's far more true for cats. Cats are like control freaks. So if you can convince that cat you're in control, that cat is going to be a more contented cat. You know, I love what you just said, because I, even dog training, I was, I always don't like to use the word training anymore, dog teaching, um, is moving in the direction of we're, we're considering more giving dogs more control, more choice. And when, pe- when you say that to people, they're like, what, what do you mean give the dog more control? Or what do you mean? Well, they're real. There's a certain empowerment and feeling of confidence where you know you have a certain amount of control over your destiny. When you don't, or just your day-to-day, when you don't, it's really disempowering. Yes, and what we know is dogs and cats are certain beings. They have feelings. Not all too different than ours. We don't express them the same way, and they don't express them the same way. And they are, after all, dogs, and they are, after all, cats. And getting back to what you said, what we know is we evolved with dogs. And, and cultures all over the world, even cultures who don't love dogs because dogs are supposed to be, quote, unquote, dirty, they can look at an image of a dog and they smile. A couple things about cats. People either love them or they hate them, first of all. And secondly, they are very, very uh, mis- often misunderstood. Uh, I can give you so many examples. I mean, one is you come home. Typically, a dog, when the dog lives with that person, not someone breaking into the house, the dog might respond differently. But assuming it's someone the dog knows and lives with, that dog is going to come up to the door and whoop, 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 and so happy, and the whole body might be wiggling and all of that. That's clear what the dog is saying. I'm happy to see you. You come home, and the cat looks at you, runs the other way, and scratches at the sofa. And what happens? People get really mad because the yeah. cat is scratching at their sofa, and, and they don't like that. But the cat is actually saying, I'm excited to see you. But there's a disconnect often, not always, but there is often a disconnect we don't quite understand as one example as to what the cat is saying. And it's interesting when cats and dogs get together, they have to learn each other's language. And some dogs and some cats are very quick learners and some are not. Uh, Some dogs and cats taunt other. I mean, we had a cat who... This is an embarrassing story. Can I tell you the story and you won't tell anybody? No, I won't tell anybody else. Don't tell anyone. So (laughs) our cat named Ricky, who was a stand-up cat, and I put cats in two categories. And one is a stand-up cat. I don't know what else to call them. And another is a typical cat. And and that typical cat might be wary and watchful. Stand-up cats uh, could be dog trainers. I mean, they are in control of the situation, they know it, and it doesn't matter if the cat is, it was a Devon Rex cat. So it's a small cat on top of it. Um, So a friend came over with his 16 year old border collie and the cat assessed the situation immediately, came down from the radiator where the cat was in the very room I'm in now, And this poor dog had arthritis in his hips, 16 years old. I mean, you know, the cat went around to the other side of the dog. And the dog saw that the cat was there and, you know, was like, okay, because this dog had been exposed to cats on and off throughout the dog's lifetime. No big deal. And the cat kept pushing the dog over. (laughs) No reason for it whatsoever. (laughs) Push the dog over, push the dog over. The dog had to get up. This little tiny cat had the confidence to do this to wow. an average size border collie. Wow. Um, cats can be difficult to figure out at times, even for those of us who believe, okay, we fully understand what they're saying, but they do say things in different ways than dogs do often, not always, but the language is different. And it's a language that 
uh, professionals aren't as adept always at understanding. And the relationship with dogs and cats, just like the relationship between two people, the relationship with two dogs, we know can be complex. Well, the relationship with dogs and cats, a dog and a cat, can be just as complex. So when you go, okay, no, the, the pandemic has obviously made it very difficult for you to go into homes, but if you have somebody call you up and say, Steve, my dog is aggressing towards my cat, what do I do? If, if well, first of all, is it aggression or is it play? So the cat's perspective may be different than what's really happening. You know, so the dog may just want to play, but the cat is thinking potentially, oh, excuse me here, I have an emergency. All right, Hazel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, that's Hazel. Uh, so the, the cat may be actually thinking I'm going to die. Literally. I, I don't know that. I'm not, I don't profess to be a cat or a cat mind reader. But I really do believe that these cats being chased may actually believe that. How bad is that? That's That's bad. bad. Yeah. With a cat, with a dog, with an absolute prey drive, particularly a dog who has a history of hurting cats, hurting H-U-R-T, not Mm -hmm. H-E-R-D, rehoming actually might be the best for the dog or the cat, because from the cat's perspective, you can't live like that. Yeah. And I can't guarantee safety. I'm not as, I, I'm not that good, you know, to, to be able to change that behavior. Now, but, but here, Steve, can I just interrupt you there? You say you're not that good, but you're, you're, you're exceptional by saying you're not that good because when you're talking about prey drive, that is a, a deeply rooted, a, a genetic, instinctive behavior that is incredibly dangerous. And I'm sorry, any trainer worth their salt would absolutely say exactly the same as you. If you have a trainer that's going to, well, I guarantee, and I guarantee that your dog is not going to chase your cat and puts a shock collar on, and maybe the shock collar works for a while, but then boom, unfortunately, something really bad happens. You know, it, it, you're working with prey drive so that yeah, the, yeah. the safety of both dog and cat is paramount. And, uh, and they're not even taking into account the stress that these animals are going through. So continue. Sorry. I just, oh, no, no, thank you. Uh, because you, you bring up a good point. So not only is there a considerable humane or welfare issue using that shock collar, even if it moderates behavior for now, as you point out, all it takes is once. But that dog is still wanting to literally kill that cat. Mm -hmm. The cat knows that. And again, living under those circumstances, if you're the cat, is horrible. That is no quality of life. And it's a potential death every day. Getting up in the morning every day thinking I might die would be terrible. So that is there is no answer that I know except rehoming. In those now, most of the time that's not the case. So let's jump to the most of the times where it's not the case. And the dog is either not learned that I shouldn't chase the cat and is chasing the cat, not necessarily for fun, but because it's a moving object. And that's what that dog does, often a younger dog. Or the dog is thinking, okay, this is this is a game of chase. What I like is to teach the dog, first of all, not to do that. But secondly, allow the cat, I talked about cats being control freaks, allow the cat to initiate the game. And if the cat initiates the game, the cat is saying, let's do this. Right. And understands. Also, cats have to understand where they can go. And most cats innately do, but not always. But they can't understand where to go if they don't have those places to go. So I'm talking about window ledges, cat trees, bookshelves, all these high up places where a dog can't physically get to. And if a cat knows I have an escape route, that's a good thing. The other thing that we don't talk about, I think often enough, is for even in multiple dog households, is for you to have, or for the dog to have, what you probably wanted when 
your child was growing up. And that is a place to go to get you away from the kid. You love your kid, but, but we all need some solitude, right? Yes. And, and giving that dog or cat a place to go away from the other where I can feel safe, that's hugely helpful for dogs. I, I suggested for people too, but I would argue even more so for cats. Yeah, I'm, I'm a great believer of setting up that safe zone, that quiet space. Um, and I'm a great believer as well, even during training sessions to allow the dog to have some kind of escape route. So um, I, for It's Meal the Dog and uh, fans of It's Meal the Dog in the UK will be able to see the second part of the series that we've filmed um, starting from March. And they'll see a, a dog called Nelly, but I'm also gonna be talking about Nelly and my presentation in the conference. And she truly was a nervous Nelly. Um, and I made sure that the door to the garden was open so that when we were working with her in the sitting room, that she, if she needed to, could just go enough. I just need to take myself out of here and take herself into the garden, which was fenced in, it was safe for her. but. I'm a really big believer of escape routes, routes for, for dogs and for a cat. So you're saying those higher places like cat trees, like shelves, the cat has to know, has to have access, but has to know that they can get there. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. And, and by also providing that, you're giving the cat some confidence. So yeah. there are uh, two reasons why cats need those higher places. One is for confident cats that just want to, I will overcess, overlook my kingdom. It is mine, 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 mine. And I will oversee what's happening literally. Other cats, it's, it's as you point out, a way to get away. And it's, I feel safe up here. I'm terrified down there. That has to be fixed. <laughs> no cat should be terrified down there. But nevertheless, at least I have a high place to go. Yeah. And, and sometimes just to get away. You know, and I really do believe, as you just said, uh, I don't want to repeat it too much, but for all of our pets, they need that, you know. So I have a pet reptile. So I even have a, the, the reptile's not walking all over the house, but there's even a hiding spot within the confines of where the reptile lives, you know. Uh, I, I, I think that's fair for all animals. I, I do. I, I do, too. Even in a multi, uh, a, a multi-dog household or yeah. a multi-species household, there do have to be times when they're separated from each other when they're away and they can have some decompression time. You think about siblings living in a house together. They all need to have their time when they can be away from each other. I mean, we all do. We all need that. Um, just can we just talk a little bit? Um, um, we're, we're coming to, to the end, but... Um, well, I know. I, well, I'm hoping that, yeah, we are. But um, can we talk a little bit about the other way around? What happens if you've got a cat, like your cat, that's like going to like play around or maybe be a bit of a bully? Yeah, cats can be too. And, and that, you know, you don't put the cat on the leash and harness necessarily. But, but we have to try to figure out, first of all, what's going on with the cat. Is the cat truly aggressive, same thing as the dog. Is the cat truly aggressing to the dog uh, because the dog is afraid? What is the number one reason why there is aggression in dogs? Well, normally fear, really. Exactly, right. Fear so it's, is it's, number exactly. one reason, yeah. Exactly, so same thing with cats is what I'm yeah. saying. So if, if that is the case, okay, that we call it aggression and it is aggression, but it's because the cat is afraid. So let's fix that. So the cat isn't afraid. And that's depending exactly on what's going on, desensitization and counter conditioning to the dog. So it's still controlling the dog, if this makes sense. So the cat isn't afraid. You know, cats, <laughs> cats are a king in, in everything I say. So I'm still saying, I'm still giving you the answer that we still have to figure out, okay, what is it about the dog's actions that are terrifying this cat. If it, the dog is doing nothing, except just, you know, walking around and doing nothing at all and not even sniffing at the cat or the cat's box or the cat's toys, you know, then what we can do is minimize anxiety other ways, uh, which I will talk about in the talk. It's too long to go into here, but it's using uh, nutraceutical products. It's desensitization and counter conditioning. 
It's positive association, so the dog appears. And then, out of nowhere, tuna or salmon, the heavy artillery comes out. So it is all fixable. Now, um, I, can, I, can we push this another five minutes? Because I do want to get into the weeds a little bit with you. Sure, um, sure. The, the, I think the reason why, one of the reasons why we get on is not just because, of course, we're crazy animal geeks and we've done a lot of seminars, we've done a lot of talks, presentations together and um, contributed to books and that. But the fact is that you're also a a flag waver for positive methods. And um, can you tell me a little bit about your journey with that? Because you are quite outspoken and you... <laughs> you um, Yep. <laughs> you maybe have caught a little bit of flack like I have for being a outspoken. <laughs> a little <laughs> but, bit. <laughs> but tell me why. Look, you're the preeminent cat slash dog behavior expert in the United States of America and in many parts of the world. Why do you speak out a, a, against it? What is it uh, uh, about those punitive methods um, that cause that's actually, you to... Yeah, that's actually a really good question. First of all, you give me way too much credit. I don't know that I'm the preeminent anything. Well, kind of. Are, but, but... Well, uh, thank you. But it, it really began when I, a couple things all at once here. First of all, I had the pleasure, honor of meeting John Paul Scott. So we know about early socialization in dogs and what it means. Yes. We know about differences in breeds. You know, I talk about, as you do, uh, my opposition to breed bands. But having said that, the reality is, and I've talked about this with Kim Brophy, who I know is speaking at your conference. Yes. The, the reality is she's brilliant. But the reality is that uh, a dachshund, in general, is just not going to have the same temperament as a melanoir. I mean, the, the, let's face it, that you know, a dog was bred, breeds, different breeds to do specific things, and for thousands of years to do that. Um, so understanding Scott's work and having met him in person, that made a profound difference uh, mm -hmm. to me. And then years later, I'm watching a performer on television. Performer is probably the right word. Uh, and he, he talked about dominance. And I knew right then that this guy was dangerous if the show became popular at all, which it did, uh, because it's, it's just wrong. Uh, I, I am aware of the fact, and I have some of those books from the 1950s and early 60s that said, okay, the only way to get a dog to do things is that the dog needs to follow you because you need to be dominant over the dog like the leader of a wolf pack, right? Well, of course, we, those who understand science today know that that is absurd. But uh, he, again, resurrected this theory that was never proven anyway. And theory isn't even the right word. It's just something out of somebody's mind that caught on. I think there's something about human beings that makes us want to be dominant over other creatures on the planet, yeah. maybe. And uh, I, I can't psychoanalyze that, but I also knew what I was seeing was wrong. And I knew that I was seeing was hurtful. And I was the first one, probably, um, and became a thorn in this person's side, as that person has told me repeatedly, not lately, but at, back in the day. Uh, because I just spoke out about what I saw and what I saw wasn't the way in my view to do television dog training. And thank I gosh know. you came along and others too, who, who said, okay, this is, this, we can help dogs. It's about families, first of all. And, uh, you, you don't need to do these things. You don't need to use shock collars. You, in fact, that's a bad thing. Not only don't you need to do it, but you're going to cause more damage. So why then, if we've come so far, which we have, I mean, I, I truly believe in this world, we, we have come so far, whereas more and more people are understanding, more and more people are sort of turning their backs um, on painful techniques or devices, you know, shock collars are being banned in different countries. Petco stopped selling shock collars in their stores um, that, uh, and online. I mean, huge. And there's a reason for that. Why or why then 
are there still, and I'm talking about television, certainly in the United States, still, and, and in the UK, still old school trainers out there? There's a, there's uh, a guy uh, who he calls it boinking, I think, where he takes, you might not even be aware of this, he takes a, 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 a bath towel, you know, big towel, wraps it up in a rubber band, and when a dog does something that he doesn't want the dog to do, he hurls this thing at the dog. Um, why do people... I, that's I guess, still acceptable on television. You would have thought that people would have learned. That's still acceptable. I mean, it's still acceptable, obviously. For, but, but I don't understand that. I mean, we're both in the entertainment business. Yeah. We both are educators. We both know, but why are we just not getting out to those people that are hiring or thinking, oh, look, this person's great. This is going to be a great show. There's going to be a lot of physical. And I, I don't, you see, I'm having a hard time still thinking about why this still goes on. I wish I could answer. Um, yeah. I can't. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, most people want to do the right thing for their pet. That yes. I believe. And I believe too. Uh, it's, it's desperation. You know, the dog won't stop fill in the blank. Uh, a trainer promises uh, through marketing to fix the problem. Uh, sometimes they show video of them fixing the problem. As you know, it's a temporary fix if you fix it all, and video can be edited also, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But um, I, 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 don't com I don't completely understand because but, – but I think having said that, we're moving in the right direction. There yeah. are more and more trainers that are Victoria Stillo trainers or, you know, clicker trainers or trainers that one way or the other, no matter what organization they're a part of, are using positive reinforcement. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, the old line you bring, and I don't profess to be a dog trainer. That's, you know, I'm a behavior consultant. There's a difference, first mm -hmm. of all. I mean, I could teach a good puppy class along with anybody, but I, uh, or kitten class, but I don't profess to be a, a dog trainer per se, but that makes my view maybe more interesting because I'm not a part of that group, you know? Yeah. So I have nothing politically to gain or not to get, if you follow what I mean. Yes, absolutely. Um, I do. You know, absolutely. Um, so, so I'm just watching from Switzerland, you know, looking in and saying, uh, I just know the science and some of these things that people do are, are really dangerous to dogs potentially, and therefore dangerous to our relationships with them. And yeah. I, I, I can't you. tell you how many veterinary behaviorists have told me, thank goodness in a way, <laughs> thank, thank goodness. This, this is where she wants to sit. <laughs> you know, our other dog passed away um, in November, or December, actually 2019. And they were best buds and they would sit together and do, I mean, it was amazing. People thought that we edited uh, images of them, uh, but I didn't. This is the way they laid together and said they were, they were glued together. And um, since that dog passed away, either my wife or I, she has to be like right on top of one of us. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And we are going to get another dog. We're just... Right. Waiting it's that, right it's that emotional anchor. It's that, you know, we talk about uh, people being emotional anchors for their dogs. And, you, you know, and I think that's something that I'm definitely going to be exploring in my presentation as well. Um, huh. You know, and, and, and so the, the reason why I, I wanted to sort of finish with that is because, A, I think you have at sometimes personal cost um, really spoken up for these animals. And I want to thank you for being their voice. Um, both for dogs and for cats, but also because it's education. And that's why we do these conferences. That's why you travel around the world, speaking of vet conferences and other conferences. That's the reason why you're doing my conference. It's, it is about educating and spreading that word. So I am, I'm really, really happy that you agreed to do this. I know that potentially virtual is not your favorite and you want to get back out there again. You are back out there again. Yeah, yeah. But I really think that people, if they come to the Dog Behavior Conference, are going to get a lot out of your talk. It is How to Be a Diplomat, Making Peace Among Cats and Dogs. Guys, if you haven't signed up, register for the Dog Behavior Conference. You can go to dogbehaviorconference.com. Look at the comments um, in, uh, in the, uh, the comments 
section, we'll put up information there about where to go to register. And then you're going to be hearing so much more from Steve Dale, who's going to be doing a kick ass presentation. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, my gosh. I'm you're one of those people you can call me at three in the morning and ask me to present and I would get up and do it for you. So I'm, I'm, I'm honored to do it. And as you mentioned, we have been talking about this particular talk for a couple of years. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, to be able to do it for you, honored to do it for you because you have such a great lineup of speakers as you always do. I do. <laughs> yeah, you do. You do. I do. I'm very, very lucky. Well, Steve, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.